Who of you is writing templates regularly? Okay. Who of you gets templates right the first time? Always. Sometimes. Often. Okay. The thing with templates is that the compiler creates code for us in the background that we cannot see. We only see it when we get an error message. And these error messages can be quite tedious to understand and read. And so we, and especially in C++, some of the language rules are quite complicated. There's a lot of reasons for them to be complicated. Uh, and especially surrounding templates, and fu especially function templates, there are some interesting rules that are correct, but not always as the programmer would expect them to be. And since the compiler hides from us what, what it's actually doing, my idea was to have uh, IDE support to showing us what the compiler would do or intends to do, so it's easier to actually debug template code, not only when it fails to compile, but when it compiles and doesn't do the right thing that we expected. Uh, just one thing, who knows what happens with this variable v? What is vector bool? Is that like a vector of char or a vector of int? There's a language expert, please. Okay, the premature optimization that happened in the 90s was that vector bool was implemented by using bits for Boolean values. And not if you de define a variable that is a, a bool, it usually get, gets a size of one uh, element that is not just a bit. And vector bool tried to optimize a memory consumption by using bits for Boolean values. That has a lot of implication that uh, this nice gentleman ex try to explain, and I don't want to go into details. It's just vector bool is a specialization of the std vector t template. And if you use vectors in generic code, you always always have to consider that there is this strange thing vector bool that has a different API than vector, that has different side effect, uh, uh, or let's say effects underneath. You still, in most cases, you get fi uh, around fine, but you might have corner cases where a vector bool just behaves differently than a regular vector, and you might get surprises. For example, you can't get the address or a pointer to, to the elements in the vector that you can get with all other vectors. Another problem is overload resolution. And that's a problem especially uh, in IDEs. Let's say we, we call we have two overloads of the function inner, one for ints, one for doubles. A template function outer that takes any kind of, of uh, type value and calling inner, and a non-templated overload of outer for ints. And if you call outer with an int, the compiler will select this overload, calling inner for ints. If you call outer with a double, Okay, the int might be a match. If there wouldn't be a, a template around, this function would still be called in the second case, but we now actually, or maybe I should use, now we're actually calling the template function, which also calls inner, and because t is deduced as a double, it calls inner with a double value, so it calls the other inner. Um, the IDE we are working with is based on Eclipse CDT, and if you go for CDT, it actually, once you're, it, you can follow the, the, the call chain and the instantiation chain, but once you end up within the template context, it will not know which overload is actually selected, and that's okay, because within the template, you don't know which overload is actually selected, because you don't know which template uh, parameter, uh, or which template argument you actually got. So, Eclipse CDT in its plain form will ask which, which uh, overload are, are you using. That's one of the deficiencies 
where you cannot easily see what's actually happening. So the compiler will actually follow the chain up to the overload of inner with a double, but the IDE cannot. That's one of the, the second of the things that overload resolution is hard. I asked yesterday, who has been to a pub quiz on C++ yet? None, all, all versions in that. So I borrowed this, that example from Oliver Modals. He, he's running pub quizzes at conferences. I think NDC and ACCU in Europe are things that he uh, has run that. So we have two, two functions called Y with a reference overload and an R value, L value reference overload and R value reference overload. And we have a main function calling y with a variable and a constant. So which y would be called in the first case? The first case, because i is an L value, it calls the L value uh, reference. And the second case with a, just a value, so that's an R value, the overload of y with the R value references is called. So we get, if we look at the output, we would get one and two. But who can actually tell you what happens when we call f, g, and h with that? Who is able to know that? Okay, the experts doing everything. But a normal programmer has a very hard time to understand the uh, problems with the forwarding references, with what happens, what x would actually be, what happens if we move it, what happens if we move uh, forward it. It's just tricky. I couldn't figure it out on my own correctly. I might come up with a solution that might get, be guessed correctly, but it's not. There's one change to the original pub quiz, and that's something our CVELOP IDE provides you if you want to step up to C++11 C++ or 14. Uh, the, let's say, the good way to initialize things is using curly braces. And I don't, go into de don't want to go into details what to do with the curly uh, why curly braces are the right way to do things. Uh, but if you don't use curly braces yet, uh, we have uh, a plugin that suggests you to change your code and it will do the change for you on your behalf. It's not completely automatic, so you don't get mess, uh, fussed with your code by, by a tool. It's just, it tells you, okay, why don't you use uh, initialization like it's supposed to be and uh, if you want to do it, it will do it for you. Questions? Yeah, we will see. So we will see in the demo. I just have to. I just reformatted the code a little bit to, and you will see in a second why. And oh, I need my glasses. If you run that code, This is the output, as you expected. Good. And this is actually the, the view that my students implemented. And if we select main here in the editor and say synchronize, we get exactly what we have here. And it shows us names. And these are clickable things. So if we click on Y calling with an, an L value, we actually end up with the correct overload that is called in that situation. If we do it for the Y with an, uh, a value, we also get the R value overload. That was the easy thing. We, could, we all could figure out that on our own. But now we call F. And what you actually see here, it shows us that it used template argument. Compare that to the F here. It 
will only show us, okay, this is a template function. So here we actually have deduced already the correct template argument. And that's the nice thing about function templates. We get this template argument deduction. And I just produce a little bit more space. Just my mouse curves is a little bit too. We see now we get F as it is defined, but it tells us, unfortunately, the font of, I couldn't figure out how to enlarge that font. We see that the T is actually int and it lost the reference, but we see the correct one here. And if we now click on Y, it will actually give us Y as it is called in this context. So we not only see the template definition, we actually see the instantiation with the T is int ref. Now go for the next. We see, okay, in this case, T is deduced as int. And if we call Y, it gives us the L value. Why is that? Well, let's make a little bit more space. In this case, x is a parameter to a function. And if you, if you use that parameter within the function body, it's like a local variable. So it's an L value. So we get the L value overload of y. So we had one, two, one, one. Now let's go for G. Here we move. So we give up X. And since we move, we create an R value. So the R value reference overload of Y is called. And if we continue that with the other G, it's the same situation. The R value overload of Y is called. Just make things a little bit smaller so that we don't lose track. And now we go for H. And here we forward it to the underlying type. So we again get from the L value reference we get perfect forwarding, we call the L value reference version of it. And for the last case, sorry, my screen space is limited. We get, did I click the last one? No. This is the last case where we get perfect forwarding of the R R value, that is an R value reference. So this means is actually we can click through the uh, template instantiations and see what, what's underneath. For those of you who have been, so, yeah, we to, to reset our templater view to what's now in, here, that's a simple case where we have template type argument deduction. We can click through, you have seen that, and see the different overloads. And here, for example, we have print value with an overload for bool, like vector bool. So we, if we call print with a bool, we get the other implementation of print value here, which is not that obvious from the code if you just look at the templates. So let's see what else I can I show. If we go, come on, where is my... That's the example of the variadic template function I showed yesterday. Uh, print lines, and if we look how Veridic templates actually look like in Templator. We see that the 
list of ar deduced arguments is actually uh, shown, so we can actually see which version of print line is, or how print line is actually instantiated. So we have a character array, which is our one string. We have a, an int, which is our two, and a double, which is 3.0. And if we go deeper into that, we see that in, in the first case, our head is character array of four, and there's a tail. And if we go, and we see the tail is actually int and double. And we go deeper, we stick with double in the end. And if we go even deeper, we get to a case that is actually never called. The tail is empty. But the compiler will actually instantiate the template with the call, even though it's never called, where so we have to provide the base case for the recursion of the very template implementation. Now we have more examples. No questions. Everybody is baffled by things. Let's see. Here we have a class template that uses vector. Sorry. And we have a specialization for doubles. And we have a factory function creating that stack from an initializer list, deducing the element type of our uh, template. So we could have written our auto here, but let's see what actually happens. Make stack int is deduced because we call it with an initializer list of ints and it will create actually a stack of ints and we can even dig down into vector and now it takes a little bit of time because vector is, is a bit bigger template and we now can even drill down and look for interesting things within vector how it is instantiated with these uh, template arguments, uh, the int and the allocator. I just want to go back and see what happens if we have a stack with bools. If we then go into the vector, it will show us, okay, we have a vector where the allocator is a bool and we see it's a specialization because it has bool here without coming from a, a template parameter. And to see that vector bool is actually different, we can search for a thing called, I believe it's flip. So come on, leave my focus. And that is something that the regular vector, oops, sorry, some navigation problem, has no idea that it exists. I hope so. Ah, come on. Non-existing. Questions? Yes? How is it implemented? So how does it get the information? It's actually implemented based on the AST of the underlying platform, CDT, um, with extensions that we created to actually provide the template instantiations. That's also why it's not perfect yet. So you have implemented this template instantiation logic? Uh, part of it is already part of uh, Eclipse CDT, so it, it actually can show you some of the argument deduction and the instantiation, but only one level. So the question is, how is it implemented? Sorry for, for not saying that. Uh, so it's uh, underneath the platform has some implementation infrastructure for template instantiations, but not the nesting. That's what my students implemented to get the nesting done. Uh, the point is, it's not perfect yet. It's not a compiler yet. So uh, we are working on getting Svenai C++14 support where we can do very interesting things. That's also one of the reasons I showed it in a VM. On my Mac, I have uh, GCC 5.2. And this, uh, the standard library of GCC 5.2 uses computed no accepts depending on the template parameter. And that's a corner case that's not handled yet by the parser. Uh, 
uh, the future, the soon uh, immediate future for the, the plan is for the next release of CVELOP that happens within a couple of weeks. Uh, it will be part of it. And the further future is actually complete the implementation of the instantiation engine. So we have CNI support and we actually have a debugger for template metaprogramming. But I cannot promise when you get that. Maybe next year around this time, but I'm not sure. It's just a hard task. Uh, I don't think so because it heavily depends on, so the question is, is it available in other IDEs? I'm not sure if there's a JetBrains p uh, person in here, you can ask them if they will uh, steal our idea and implement that. Uh, they are clay, uh, at, when my students released the video, they were claiming that they are plan have plans to do something similar, but I think they all also have a long way to go to implement a very good C++ parser. It's just hard. But you still have to. Uh, Actually, the, there is a, an extension uh, to do Clang code base. It's not merged, so there is a patch you have to download. You can patch Clang, but that, in that case, you can get all this information from Clang, and that's but as correct I, as Clang. But it gives you output as text. But I've it seen. It gives you output as a product buffer, which you can then convert to a text, to an XML, to a program. But it's not, uh, you don't get the visualization and the interaction. The point is, you get yeah. all the instantiation information from the Clang tooling, yeah. and you don't get the nice visualization where you can actually click through. Yeah, so it's, it's like if you put an arrow in the inner nested template a compiler, you get the same information from, from any compiler as a template instantiation sequence, but it's not, not the same. You might consider getting this information from Clang, and then um, be First thing, Clang is, not, we don't want to couple us uh, to Clang because uh, especially when we started out, Clang wasn't available on Windows. So that's why it's not Clang. And also I want to have the built-in parser and the AST very, very good so that all our refactorings, which go far beyond what you can do with Clang ASTs, uh, actually work with it. So there's, there's a motivation to get a, get a better IDE. So it makes develop better and now we have a competition, so we, we have even more things. The only problem is uh, we have to do it all with student work or money that I get from other projects to, to, to invest in that. So it's not, we don't have uh, the financial resources of a company like JetBrains. Any more questions? I think we are soon to stop. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you can do that with any function where it could, uh, but you cannot do it. You cannot do it with the template function because then you don't, you, uh, so the question was, can, can I do it in another function? I just used main as for convenience. You can do it wherever you have an instantiation context of a template. You cannot do it from a template function because then you don't know which uh, arguments are actually there. So that's, that's the only uh, limitation. It's not, so if you directly go into vector t, then you cannot use it reasonably because you don't know which value of t you get. Another question? Sorry. So the question is, how do you manage pre-processing? Uh, the good thing is we implemented all the hand or a lot of the handling of pre-processing and the AST so we actually use the unpreprocessed code. But we know what the preprocessor would output. And that's a problem we have already with our refactorings. For example, if you extract a function, you want to keep the original macros and not the expanded version in the extracted function. And that's a, a problem we, we, we solved. Uh, what's not perfect yet is uh, if you have if defs or uh, conditional compilation, someone is playing with the lights. Uh, conditional compilation, then we only see one branch of it because you get combinatorial explosion of all the branches that you get if, if you have too many. So 
get rid of if devs as far uh, as you can, and then then it's you're you're good. And I think I have to finish because there's another talk supposed to happen on. I stay here until Thursday noon. If you have more questions, take the Civilop uh, token with you, and otherwise feel free to contact me with further questions. If you want to try it today, I can even point you to. Uh, well, I, I shouldn't say that, but I can point you to an update site to install it in Civilop of today. But you might get some problems. Uh, that are unexpected. So, a final question, or otherwise, I think thank you for attending. <laughs>